you're, of course, Andrew Hogue. Mm -hmm. And other than everything else you've done, which we're going to touch on some of that, you actually run your own online radio station now, andrewhogue.com. We also have a Facebook page, which is uh, Andrew Hogue Radio. Launched it in November 2012 and haven't blinked since. Yeah, well, I was reading your bio. You actually, up until early this year, you were managing a German-based record label in Australia for, what, 16 years. Yeah, well, that's kind of the, I guess, the hidden day job because a lot of people would say, oh, how do you manage Triple J and your band Contrive? I said, well, I've got a day job on top of that too that uh, a lot of people weren't really aware of. I mean, that's, that's what I did. And yeah, I finished that at the end of uh, January. I mean, the record industry, as we know, is certainly in a, a huge change and transition. Some would say free fall, some would say doom and gloom. I think it's just a sign of the times and it's another evolution in our evolving lives with technology taking the forefront. So uh, I just reached that point where, you know, it, it kind of ran its course and, and my main focus was building the station and, you know, moving forward with that. It was a phenomenal ride. I mean, you know, how many people last jobs for five years, let alone 16, especially in the music industry as well, considering how much it has changed. So I just felt time was right to... Uh, to move forward so yeah long time but a great time yeah and you did for 10 years of course you had your show on triple j as you mentioned before because you had a day job at the same time i guess people think if you work for triple j then that's going to pay the bills but if you've only got one weekly show i guess that's definitely not going to pay the bills is it oh the standing i mean someone said to me once at a gig that you know I, I heard I fly in from Sydney or Melbourne on helicopter. I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> you know, I wish. But, uh, and again, like I said, it, it really isn't about the money. It's That's actually what astounded me when I started the ABC at the time because Triple R was a voluntary thing. And I remember, you know, sorting out the employment forms and the security tag and all that stuff. And then they just said, oh, you know, we need bank details. I said, what for? And they said, because we pay you for this. I was like, what? And that just astounded me because, you know, the key to me, I think, for a lot of success is not to chase the money. I know to a point you've got to be aware, especially what I'm doing now because I'm running a business as well. This station doesn't run for free. It costs money to run. But ultimately, to keep your focus on why you're doing things is to, you know, share what you what you love with people. And that's why, again, I was astounded at the Jays when uh, they would pay me for doing that every week. And, and that's why I, I never took it for granted. It was never a paycheck. It was just, this is really unbelievable. And, and that 10-year ride I had felt like two. You know, it just went and I was just, you know, you get so engrossed in something, time is irrelevant because you love what you do. And that's why still having that fire and passion is why I went ahead and built the station. I thought, well, okay, one door closes. I've got to go find another one to open. And that's exactly what I did. So obviously the radio station, your online station, is now the focus. So, well, you've been doing that for two years. So I guess it's providing you enough of an income now that you don't need another day job? Yeah, well, like I said, it has its costs as well. I've got many other projects on the go too, so I'm never short of things to do. But uh, again, you know, the focus, yeah, is to keep following the passion. And I've been doing radio 20 years pretty much without a year off. And, you know, as they say, you've got to follow your passion and, and, and that's the plan. And to me, I think a station like this is needed in this country. Uh, I mean, it's great that there's many other stations out there supporting heavy music. Unfortunately, most of them do get shoved on a ridiculous hour in the evening, which sucks. It's always been like that, that, oh, let's just stick them in the corner at night and no one's going to sort of bother with it. And that's something that's always been frustrating for myself doing radio. I mean, I've done programs from midnight to 2 a.m. on a Sunday night for years and, you know, weeknight shows. And, and it's just crazy how people think that people like us who like this music, you know, don't have jobs or school or study or, or time for sleep. Of course we do. So, again, like I said, it's, it's something I think that the country needs in the sense of just how much music is out there now and very little exposure they're getting from sort of mainstream media. So that's why I, I went ahead and did this because, you know, we've got to provide something that uh, is needed and so far so good and ain't looking back. Well, let's go back to the start of your radio career. You actually started in 93 just doing a segment at Triple R on the heavy metal show. Yeah, but prior to that, I used to wag school around 17 and go into free PBS when they had their afternoon metal shows on. And, you know, because I befriended all the DJs going to gigs and, you know, you'll sort of 
walk through a crowd and you hear somebody talking and you recognize the voice and, you know, you kind of talk to them, hey, I listen to your show and, and some of the DJs I, yeah, became friends with and kept in touch with and called in regularly for requests and most of the time they'd say, yeah, just come in and hang out. So that's kind of where it really started. It's not something I ever planned. I often get questions of, oh, how did you get in the industry? And I used to ask people the same thing uh, growing up, you know, how did you get into it? And most would say, yeah, I just fell into it. And I was like, but how, but how? But now people ask me that I'd say the exact same thing. So that's kind of when it sort of started, but officially with Triple R and, and learning, I guess, to be a, a presenter was definitely year 93 when I started doing a, a local demo segment and 20 years and kept going. Well, you said you fell into radio and that, but it was obviously your passion that led you into it and it sounds like that's still going. How did you find actually having to put on that business hat and focus on money for your station? That must be uncomfortable. Well, it's actually pretty easy because running a record label for 16 years, I've got long-term established relationships with not only media but also other business people that I've dealt with through my years at Triple J so it's just basically business as usual to me there's no there's been no gap it's just meeting a lot of new people now which is really cool and it's even better that most of them know who I am and what my track record is because usually you're going to email someone you don't know you've got to introduce yourself so you've got to sort of elaborate a bit on hey you know this is what I've done and and most would respond straight away of knowing exactly who I was. So, I mean, I never expect everyone to know who I am. So I don't sort of walk around expecting that. <laughs> but um, as far as the business thing, not at all. I mean, I, I think I've definitely, with the opportunities, have, have had the best of both worlds and, and learned both sides. And it's been a huge help in what I've managed to learn and the contacts I've made. And I think, yeah, all of it rolls into one. So there really isn't much of a change at all. It's not like... I'm hitting up Dunlop tires for sponsorship. I mean, I'm not focusing on businesses that aren't related to the audience, really. I mean, you know, dealing with people outside of that world would be quite interesting and, and foreign. But, you know, to me, it's a station that we focus on targeting, you know, various products to, to our listeners that are interested in that, you know. So, yeah, that's why I don't really delve into, you know, other businesses outside of that sort of realm. I've got someone who always says to me, your name is your brand, and that is really true for you and, and to the extent that you named your radio station your name. Well, I'll be honest with you, I never planned on that. I had a, a good friend of mine, kind of a business mentor, and I was trying to come up with names. You know, there's a, thousands of internet radio stations online, and most of them are pretty, you know, rockmetal.org and heavymetalradio.com, and it's like, okay... I was trying to come up with a name and, and I just thought, you know, I'm going to fall through the cracks with a billion other ones that are out there because, again, I'm starting from the bottom, you know. And uh, a mate of mine just said, why don't you just use your name? And I was like, ooh, you know, as some would say, oh, it's a bit egotistical. And he goes, no, that, you know, Triple J branded your name for so many years. People know it. They know what they're going to get. And it's a trusted name in, in a lot of respects. And I'd like to think a respected one too. So... I just sort of went with that and it's fine. Like now I just think, okay, it's just like just part of the, it's part of what I do, even though it's the name of the station. Like some people I talk to, you know, about the name, they sort of go, oh, okay, andrewhope.com. But the fact is that the track record already speaks for itself. People don't bat an eyelid with it. They already know what, what they're going to get from something that's sort of established and trusted. Whereas if I was going to come up with an unknown name, well, then I'd have to say, hi, this is what I'm doing. This is my station, you know, metalmetal.com or whatever. And then I have to start hitting them with my past to say it's reputable. But the fact that the name's already out there, I think it just yeah, it spoke for itself. And I went ahead and used it, and now it's stuck <laughs> for most people. Yeah. Well, it works for you because, like you said, you everyone does, like around the heavy music scene, everyone knows who you are anyway. And that's where you're focused. So that's what counts. Are your programs that you've got on it, do you do them live or are they pre-recorded? No, we do the shows live every week. We've got uh, Heavy at Home Monday nights. That's an all-Australian show from 8pm. And then we've got the Hogue Metal show, which is cramming in a billion new releases every week from 9 till midnight as well. So, But obviously we're planning on you know, new programs coming up and also featuring a lot of other uh, established names. So as they say, watch this space. All right, so you're talking to some of the people in bands and that to do shows for you? 
I've got a few contacts out and about. I think I'll keep it at that for the moment. Just uh, keep an eye on the on the website. <laughs> Don't want to let the cat out of the bag. Well, you've spoken to people like Ozzy Osbourne and people from Judas Priest and Ronnie James Dio and Steve Harris from Iron Maiden, as well as probably a lot, lot more. Do you have an interview that you've done that was memorable to you, like that was your crowning moment? Well, I mean, my years at the Jays, I did 600 interviews in those 10 years, and obviously with Triple R, I'd done another 200, 300 plus, I guess. There's so many, to be honest, and, and the great thing is some of the fans I've spoken to have become personal friends. I mean, we've obviously built a, a great connection through dialogue, but highlights, obviously, Ozzy, I've interviewed him many times now, both in person and on the phone. His headful was hurt, certainly a huge honour that was at the My Music Bowl for their sideshow for the big days out in 2004, and yeah, he was great. I mean, I don't get starstruck, I believe we're all just people and and now with social media it's bringing down that illusion of rock stardom to now that you're just another person in starbucks just like me i saw your twitter post and you're like me i don't care how much money you got in the bank or how famous you are i think it's it's brought that down to a level but when i i meet some of these bands i'm just inspired the fact that they decided in their lives that this is what they're going to do and stick at it. And yeah, a lot of luck comes into this too. I know people are drawn to the illusion of being a super famous star or whatever, but, you know, to the point if you chase things, sometimes you can get let down or you're constantly chasing and you may never get there. But for someone like Ed feels, yeah, just that presence, knowing obviously I've followed his career for so many years and knowing the things he's achieved and experienced, that's what I find inspiring the most, just the fact that these people aren't sticking to the norm, nine to five, which isn't a anything wrong with that if that's how others choose to live but just the fact that I get to meet these people and learn from them not just what they've done but just how they are as people what they have to say and I don't always go with the approach of tell us about your favorite tour questions you know I always try and get into the person's head a little bit and sort of try and get a bit more of a human element out of them so I find that depends who you speak to some people are quite open and I think it's all in the approach when you interview somebody. It's just person to person and make sure the spotlight's on them at all times. But James Hetfield, definitely, obviously Steve Harris on the Iron Maiden Ed Force One plane was just untoppable in a lot of ways. But then interviewing Bruce Dickinson backstage in Bali when I saw them in yeah, Indonesia in 2012. God, there's heaps. <laughs> I mean, I start sort of racking my brains now because I've been to Varken German Festival about six times, so... I've done a lot of interviews there, and yeah, there's so many, to be honest. I've rarely had any difficult ones. A lot of people said, who's been the biggest, you know, wanker you've interviewed? But, I mean, if you go in there trying to stir the pot and get controversy from people, you will get sometimes a negative reaction, and I've never been one to dig on someone's past or something's going wrong at home, and it's been out in the tabloids. I sometimes think that personal space is personal space, because I, for one, if I had some issues that got made public as far as you know, my family or whatever, I, I really hate if, if someone sort of threw that in my face. So, you know, you see a lot of people going for that approach just to get a headline, and I've never never taken that approach. Just inspiring to speak to uh, people that are doing what they love. I think that's the, the crux of it all for me, just to keep talking to people that are following their goals and dreams. I think I, I get what you mean. I'm the same way. It's like I think actually living your dreams and – being out in the public and being judged on your music and stuff like that, that takes so much courage. And I really admire people, even if it's not, even if I don't love their music, I still admire the fact that they've got the courage to do it. Yeah, well, the truth is, you know, most people will drag others down because it shows their insecurities. I mean, you know, I've copped crap God knows how long and I'm just used to it. You get immune to the fact that that's just how some people are and they want to choose to be that way, leave it with them. I know not everyone's going to like the station or they're going to, you know, turn it on and hear a song they hate and then turn it off. It's like that's that's what people do with radio or TV. We channel skip. We expect to see something we want at that time. When we don't get it, we move on. You know, again, yeah, just being inspired by people that are following their dreams. I think that everyone has the choice to do that. I think... Some give up because it can be a slog, and I'm not lying that my whole uh, journey has not been has been nothing but a slog, and it still is. You know, I mean, when people talk about ah, oh, you've made it, I, I just think that is an illusion. You can't define making it. You know, it's all internal, really. You just got to keep 
doing what you're doing and, and just keep at it. As like when, when people talk about living the dream, you know, I know that's a bit of a cliche, but I've always twisted that to other people and said, you know, I'm living the reality because you've dreamt of something you want to do. And once you make it a reality, well, then you are living your reality as opposed to your dream. Dream is just wishing for stuff reality is doing, you know. But I always take the piss when you say, ah, oh, living the dream, you know. And most who say that, it's almost like it is a cliche that to a lot of people, the dream is out of reach. So others will always say, oh, you're living your dream. In other words, uh, you'll get to reality soon when, it, when you wake up. But it's like, it doesn't have to be like that. You know, you can just keep in reality and keep going. Well, I think there's a difference between living the dream and living your dreams too because oh, for sure. living your dreams can quite often cost you a lot of money and be a hard slog like with a lot of bands and that. And even with your radio station, you know, to me, to you almost starting again because, you, like you said, you had to start at the bottom and build it up. Well, it is. I, I tell people, you know, that, like this is what I tell people about Triple J, you know, they made their decision to, to move me on and, again, that's what they did and I look at it this way. I say, well, you know, I lost a, a job and a paycheck but I didn't lose my skills, uh, contacts and passion for what I love doing. So they're all mine. So as long as I've got those... Um, again, start from the bottom, that's fine. But those things that I have is only going to en enhance what I've created and it has done that. So that's what I tell people, you know, I'm starting from the ground, but the fact that the, the name's, you know, still relatively established and people still remember it are still keen, that outweighs the loss, so to speak. And plus the freedom I have now is immense. I mean, for three hours a week, for a genre that's so unrepresented in all forms, I tell people, you know, because some people say, oh, I miss you on, on, on the show. And I just said, look, it's, it's past. I'm, I'm doing this show now. You can tune in on Tuesday if you want. That's where you'll find me. It's, you know, some people haven't mentally adapted, to, you know, the, the wonderful world of technology. And I tell them, look, you know, from three hours a week to 24-7, take your pick. Well, you do say it's a metal and rock station like, what sort of rock do you actually include in that, or is it more heavy rock and metal? That's the thing. I mean, if you put metal, and so many people have their version of what they think metal is, and it is, it's becoming a joke today. The segregation's getting worse because of everyone's so aggressively passionate about what they like, yet they won't accept others' passion or respect it. And then that becomes all the infighting, and it's all derived from ego or peer pressure, and I think it's pathetic. So... I've been a massive fan of all forms of heavy rock music. You know, people listen to Deep Purple, oh, they're not metal, they're rock. You know, but they've got the origins of, of heavy music. So to establish the station as rock and metal, I figured, all right, I'm going to sort of kill two birds with one stone here and uh, encompass as much of the broad sounds of the heavy music genre as I can where, you know, when we program a playlist, I'll go from Soundgarden, which some would say they're not metal, but, hey, they're rock, they're, they're heavy rock, uh, and then it will follow by Bolt Thrower, which is, you know, death metal, and then I'll, I'll go into something like, you know, Def Leppard, which some would say that's glam metal. i say, well, that's, you know, still rock. Obviously, we don't really go near the Foo Fighters or the Nickelbacks, even though, to me, that's still heavy rock music that's already covered from major stations that, you know is already covered. So our, our approach is to sort of cover more the lesser known bands or the ones that people once listened to and don't hear on commercial radio anymore. So they don't know exist. So with that approach, I thought, well, to me, you're celebrating 40 years of, of all forms of, of heavy music. So that's why I keep it broad. And that's why I tell people, you're going to hear stuff you love, hate, you've heard a billion times you haven't heard before and uh, revel in it. If you don't like it, okay, you can change the channel, fine. Or I've, I've always told people as well, don't be selfish with music. If you hear a band you can't stand, but your friends are into it, Shot it down and say, I heard this horrendous power metal band that I know you dig. Check them out, you know, because I, I tell people, you might be into a certain style and you really want to share it with your friends, great, but they might not like it, but they might be into something else. So I tell people, don't be selfish with music. Just, you know, share it with your friends. Tell people about a certain style. So we, we just try and cover, you know, everything across the board. And that's why especially when I listen to it as well, you know, when we also put together playlists, you know, the diverse, the, the, the key really is to showcase the diversity of, of heavy music. Yeah, I was just about to actually go into Contrive and, like, it, that spun out a bit because, like, it does say you started the band with your twin brother, but I had a look at your website and he's not just your twin brother, he's your identical twin brother. Well, we look a little bit different these days, but, yeah, a lot of people see us who don't know us and just go, most go, are you guys 
brothers or twins? And yep, you know. I'm used to the comparisons, but yeah, he's my identical twin brother and he's 20 minutes older. Big difference. And yeah, we've been at that for a, a number of years and working on album number three and here comes a cliche. It's just the best one we've ever done. So uh, yeah, we're close to getting that sort of at least finalised as far as songs and the structure and things like that. But we've always prided ourselves on standing out rather than blending in and we'll just keep doing that, you know? Yeah, and you've, of course, toured with a lot of Big name bands, Skin Lab and Sepatura and Parkway Drive and yeah. Stone Sour too, Opeth, Machine Head. Wow. So I guess, like, you've been doing that since 1999. That's just as much a part of your life as anything else. I guess you're not thinking of ever letting that go for your radio station, are you? No, I mean, to me, you know, juggle it all, do it all. I, I believe in that. Look at Bruce Dickinson. I mean, it can be done. I mean, I'm still trying to get my time management down, but, uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, if it's something you're into, do it. I think that's how I look at it. Life's short, and why the hell not, you know? It's, when some things lead you down that path, you might as well just hang on and, and just keep going with it. You know, we've given no time limit on this. We get friends going, oh, you guys still doing that, oh, you know, and, and you know, the illusion of success, oh, just because you're not famous, you know, how long are you going to stick it out for? I mean, that's not what we're chasing, but unfortunately most people do, or you're judged on how popular your band is that resonates success. And I think success is always an internal thing. And uh, end of the day, you know, you can be at the top, but you're always going to come back down. So don't even focus on the external factor of it. That's just part of the journey. But like I tell my brother, I go, you know, pardon the cliche again, we are living our dreams. We dreamt of playing in a band and we saved money, bought instruments, practiced. Now we're out there playing on on stages and that is living a dream, making a reality. I mean, a lot of bands I speak to don't even think like that. And I just think you're not even enjoying the process. You're too busy chasing that, as I say, illusion of success. Okay, you know, everyone wants to be the next Metallica, but good luck. You know, I'm sure you asked James Hetfield, he's 23, you guys are going to be multi-millionaires in years to come and you're going to be the one of the biggest bands in the history of heavy music. I'm sure he would have just laughed because I would think at that point in his life wouldn't even been thinking, you know, years ahead because a lot of those guys were living for now and I think that's what most people should be doing. You know, keep an eye on the future but stay in the present because you don't know what's going to serve it up. And so again with the band, you know, our, as some would say, 13-year career feels like five or six to us you know we're not like yeah we've been slogging it mate we hear a lot of bands say that they feel like they owed a career or owed owed something because they've been doing it for x amount of years and haven't caught a break it's like well you know maybe there's a reason for that to happen on the same with our band we've never been signed maybe there's a reason maybe what we're doing isn't what everyone's into and we're cool with that you know i'm not going to sit there and play victim to our circumstance we've chosen to play the music we want to play and write the way we want to play and whatever happens happens And, you know, as years gone, I I feel more and more comfortable with this way of thinking as opposed to, yes, starting out, you're totally inspired to be your idols and tour and play and massive gigs and all that stuff. That's the reason why you're drawn to that. It's like people want to play sport. They want to play in the big stadiums and have the crowd go nuts and kick that goal and blah, blah, blah. I mean, there's nothing wrong with being drawn to any of those kind of uh, aspirations for sure. But, you know, the key is just to, to stay in reality and focus bit by bit. Yeah, and your last album, The Internal Dialogue, was actually mixed by Devon Townsend. Yeah, that was a great experience. I mean, I've been personal friends with Devon for over 15 years, so to work with him for two weeks in in Vancouver, and I mean, to me, he's one of my best friends, so it was just utter hilarity on top of uh, a great, you know, result as far as our album. I mean, we're happy with it, of course. It's just funny because a lot of people have trouble knowing that you're personal friends with some of these people because some people hold those people in high regard, which isn't a bad thing. I mean, God, look at what he's done. He's he's had an incredible musical journey. But a lot of people say, what was it like working with Devin? I said, well, he's he's, he's a mate. So, you know, there were times of absolute laughter and then, okay, what about this part? Actually, could you, you know, try and boost this level here? Okay, cool. But... Most of the time, it was just hanging with one of your friends as you do at home if someone's working on a studio and, and mixing. That's the way I see it, because that's how it was. Whereas, you know, if I went and worked with someone I've never met before, yeah, I'd have a different answer. Actually, it was a bit nerve-wracking. I've never met him before or or work with her or whatever. But you're working with one of your friends, it's the same as anybody else. You're working with one of your mates. It just so happens to be someone that everyone holds in high regard as super famous. 
Well, you said before that you don't necessarily get starstruck by these people and that, and you have interviewed a lot of people and you've had a long career, but what about that, what, 15, 16-year-old kid who first started slipping into PBS? Do you think he would have been really excited if he'd known in the future you would be calling Devon Townsend a mate? Oh, for sure. I mean, absolutely. But obviously over the years with the ride, you know, you just adapt to, to how things are unfolding. But yeah, I mean, without a doubt. I mean, if you told me all the things that I've experienced at that age of being mates with, you know, such and such and hanging out with and doing all these things, uh, you know, I'd just be like, yeah, right. Because, you know, at that time, you just don't see it as real. you got posters of these people, you know, on your wall, so to speak, and, and you know, now personal friends with them. I mean, I, I tell people I'm my inspirations I'm personal friends with, and, and I find that it blows me away with, with, you know, with drumming. It's like all the guys I idolised, I've become really good personal friends with. And I still, that, that still blows me away because, you know, you get to sort of see the human element of, that these people are human, uh, but it still forever inspires me that I've managed to be a part of their lives as well and, and being in their presence, but talking to them is just another friend. But obviously I ask technical questions as well, drumming questions. Of course, I'm going to ask from some of the greats. Why not? I mean, you know, you'd be mad not to, you know, again, as I say, learn from your friends or your peers. I mean, you know. Yeah, because you are the drummer, of course, in Contrive. Yeah. Can you think of anyone that you haven't met or haven't spoken to that would make you feel like that 16-year-old kid that would be like, I can't believe I'm talking to you? Ooh, I reckon probably Dee Snyder from Twisted Sister, one of the first bands I ever got into. Probably him. I mean, he's just such a great personality and a great talker. I mean, like I said, I wouldn't be starstruck. I'd just be like, it is just a really great honor to, to talk to you that that's how I approach it you know because people know how you carry on you know I mean sometimes I meet people and they're a bit nervous talking to me and it's awkward because it's like just be yourself don't worry about that stuff you know so there's no need for me to sort of be like that either uh, but just to talk to them and, and express how I feel I mean there's some bands I've met and I've sort of said hey you know massive fan and sometimes they're just going yeah cool whatever because I've heard it a billion times, but it's fine. I've been sincere. I've said what I meant, and, and that's it. And again, not every person I meet I've struck a friendship with. Of course not. You know, as long as I say what I mean and, and I'm all authentic about it, you know, it's fine. But yeah, Dee Snyder, for sure. I mean, yeah, he's just such an outspoken character in, in, in heavy music and a very intelligent person. And he's one of them. Who else would there be? Jesus. I mean, where do I go from here? Just trying to think now. Rattle off some names. It's hard because most of them I have met, I really have. I mean, I've been so privileged. Uh, you know, maybe Tony Iommi from, from Black Sabbath would be great. Uh, Bill Ward would be really cool. I mean, we're just talking people that have done things for such a long time, you know. I mean, old school for some, but just the fact that they've ma managed to retain a career in such a changed industry is, again, admirable because they're still dealing with the changes themselves. They're still on the ride. They've got to go with the ups and downs just like they experienced in their earlier years and through the next generation and the one after that and one after that. And the fact that, you know, they're still holding on, going through it, just like everybody else, and they've done so much before that is, again, a, a admirable. And, and I think it's something you can learn from as well. I'm actually going to jump back a couple of steps now because I mentioned that Devon Townsend produced your, mixed your last album. You're actually working on your new one yourself, aren't you? Yeah, we're about, uh, we're looking probably about nine songs for the new album. We're not one of these, oh, we've got to have 15 of our best tracks, we're going to make it go for 70 minutes. None of it's planned. I mean, songs will go as long as it needs to and that's, down to our own attention span, and that's how we play. We play for ourselves. A lot of bands say that, but once they get a following, you find that they start, you know, rehashing the same stuff because they don't want to lose their precious fan base because people are so fickle today. There's so much variety that people can just up and leave if they don't like something new on your menu when they're used to getting the same stuff. So for us, yeah, about nine songs. But are you self-mixing it? No, we haven't established that point yet. We're just getting the structures of the songs down. A lot of people have asked, you know, we're going to use Devon again and stuff like that. But again, we'll just cross that bridge when we get to it. At the moment, we want to uh, get the songs down that we're 100% happy with and structures and, and sounds and things like that. And then we'll sort of hit, you know, plan B and say, right, who you reckon would, you know, put a good, you know, sheen on, on these songs mix-wise? 
I mean, Devin obviously could be a possibility. It depends on his, his schedule as well. Whether we think that, you know, these new songs need the Townsend touch, uh, we don't know. So we'll just have to cross that bridge closer to the time. But uh, I'd say our new stuff is better than our old stuff, cliche. It's hard to explain. It's definitely more aggressive and a lot more uh, emotional and atmospheric. I don't know. I mean, people are going to box it no matter what you do. So to me, we'll just put it out there once it's ready and we'll just see what people make of it, you know? Yeah. Can I ask, does your brother Paul, does he work with you on your radio show at the station or anything? Uh, not really. He's done a few bits and pieces, but, you know, I might even offer him a program one day just to talk crap or maybe both of us would get on the air and talk. But he, he does a lot of other uh, work outside of that, and obviously he focuses a lot on the band as well. But, uh, you know, he's, he's an avid listener as well. He always throws in suggestions and things like that. So, you know, I generally listen to what he has to say because he's a listener too, so they're, they're important to uh, find out what they're thinking and what they like. So you've always sort of worked together in the band and that, but you haven't ever, like, just, like, your lives are separate. You've still got your own things going on outside of your band. Yeah, I think our lives sort of went into a bit of a different direction the last, I guess, 10 years or so. I mean, you know, Paul worked at JB Hi-Fi for, for many years and then he just reached his point with, you know, music retail, just got bugger it, so he, he ended up quitting. So, But there was a time we were both sort of on the same path as far as being in the business of music, working in it and playing as well but you know he just reached his point where he was over it and moved on and, and I've just kept on this path but uh, we're still obviously together doing stuff with the band and yeah we have other, other lives and interests but uh, playing is certainly a huge factor in our lives and keeping us together and what we love doing so that's not going to change anytime soon no time limit on that no and I guess before I let you go we'll talk quickly about your television career as, as such. In 2001, you actually guest programmed Rage, which, I mean, that was actually just before you started at Triple J, wasn't it? No, I think I think it was 2003. I know I'd already started the J. It could have been 2003, I think. It was. All right. So it was after you started at Triple J. What, how fun was that? Oh, that's just the mecca. I mean, I wanted to create a program for listeners. I just said, oh, you know, we'll get listeners to request. And they're like, no, this is your choice. It's like, what? You know, I go, no, it's, you know, what you say, go. And I was like, wow, this is probably one of the most indulgent opportunities I get next to doing radio every week that I, it, I was just a bit flawed. So I just went to town. They sent me the list and I just showed a stack of stuff. And it was funny because obviously it was just, I was playing things that I'd never seen before, stuff that I would grew up on. And uh, yeah, a few people complain too much glam. I'm thinking, hmm, there's like four bands, Wasp, Twisted Sister, Motley Crue, and, you know, Rat, and they were the sort of, you know, hard rock bands that I was growing up listening to as well. So I don't know where that was an overload. But uh, I mean, yeah, it, it, was, it was just an amazing opportunity. Most of the takes were one take, and they kept telling us they're going to use it as a how to do it properly real, because a lot of the bands that they had come in just had no clue on how to program such a show. So I think, obviously, the radio experience probably helped that a little bit. But, yeah, just going through the archives and choosing clips, because I used to stay up and watch Rage and their Metal Night Store, they'd show it ridiculous metal clips at four in the morning or something like that, which I think they still do these days. And just see again, shove it in the corner late at night and we'll just chuck on three clips to keep the people happy and that's it. But, you know, thank God for YouTube. We don't have to worry about that anymore. But again, yeah, for its time, it was uh, an amazing opportunity. And yeah, one that I don't, you know, forget. It was awesome. And you have had your own show on Channel 31 as well as hosting a four-hour special on MTV, Headbangers Ball. Yeah, the Metal Vision stuff was a lot of fun. That was, you know, completely no budget, but it was good. I mean, all this stuff's just a stepping stone to the next step, really, and you just keep doing things. I mean, that's how I look at this thing. Just don't limit yourself. Just throw yourself in and, you know, see what you can come up with. So are you thinking about actually getting cameras in your studio for when you do your radio shows? Oh, like a webcast kind of thing? Yeah. I've looked into it briefly, but, I mean, there's a few stations that have done it, but you're just going to be seeing me sitting there pressing buttons and stuff. I don't know if that's exciting for some people to get a look at. But, yeah, I guess, you know, the technology's here, the future's here. I mean, anything's possible now, really. So we'll just have to see what it brings. But at the moment, it's just, you know, focusing on the back end, getting more content on there, more updated stuff and new stuff, and enjoying the programs and making sure the programs are great. 
and of course adding new ones shortly. And there's yeah, just a lot, a lot to do more than most people think. But again, they don't need to worry about behind the scenes. It's all about you know what is uh, served up, and and that's all that matters. So I'll just keep you know chip it away. What advice would you give young people out there? I suppose in the metal genre, mostly who was just starting out, maybe getting into radio, thinking about what they're going to do with their band or anything. Is there a piece of advice that you've been given that you think you'd like to pass on? Well, that's funny because I always ask bands the same question. I'd say just, you know, again, I'm probably full of cliches today, but just be true to yourself. I mean, really, really be true to yourself. Ask yourself why you're doing it, what's your motive, and then you'll soon realise if you're really in this for the right reasons or you're in it for a quick fix. If that's the case, you won't be around long. Also, respect people. There are some total assholes in this business. I'm not afraid to put my hand up to tell people that the industry is filled with a lot of people I think should be culled uh, because there's no, what's the word, uh, etiquette control. Anyone can just print off a business card and say, I'm a manager or, you know, I'm this and that. Like, just, you know, self-created statuses. And most of them have no communication skills. They just come in and, and use the title on their card and, oh, I've got to act like that. I've got to be a prick or, you know, and it's so uncalled for. I think that, you know, end of the day, people want to be spoken to as a normal person and uh, I think communication and respect is everything. I don't care what you've done, how much money you've got in the bank or what courses you've done. If you can't string a sentence that's professional when you're dealing with certain people, you're not going to last long. And that's my main advice to people, just just be honest to yourself and and respect other people and just, you know, deal with the ego. You're going to find a lot of them. Unfortunately, a lot of people think that ego is the way to go. It's not. There's a difference between being confident about what you're doing and thinking that you're the shit. Uh, And those lines can get blurred pretty, pretty easily. And sometimes people that are in that can't differentiate between the two. I think a lot of this stuff that I just mentioned doesn't get covered in a lot of these courses uh, or at least advice from people. I'm just very direct about it because I've seen it happen. I've dealt with it numerous times and I still deal with it now, even dealing with a new generation of people that have just got out of a business course of school and, you know, and, and dealing with them. It's like there's a lot of things that people are missing that they're not understanding. And these are things that aren't in the textbook that uh, I think are vital is uh, people skills. You know, you can hit the books and learn all these things, but again, if if you're a dick, you're going to get stuck there. And uh, it doesn't matter how many exams you passed or whatever, they're crucial too, don't get me wrong. Learning those skills or whatever you can pick up is crucial. But And and that's like I said, this industry isn't policed in a way where kind of anything goes. And just, you know, learn from your mistakes, learn from others' mistakes, and just keep at it and keep into doing it you know, because you love doing it and don't expect a massive paycheck, don't expect, uh, you know, a huge payoff straight away. I mean, I'm eating 20 years and I don't, it doesn't feel like that to me because I still love what I do. I don't count the I'm owed something kind of deal, you know, because that's when you get frustrated, you start chasing something. Uh, and, and that's what separates those who want to stick it out and those who just don't last. So, yeah, end of the day, communication is key, respect people. Grit your teeth if you're up against some dickhead that you're not going to like or you're not going to get along with because there's plenty of them out there and, yeah, you can't be friends with everybody either. But if you're on your on your journey to sort of hopefully get something from them or offer them something, you know, you'll bump heads, but, you know, grit your teeth, stand your ground, but just conduct yourself in a calm manner instead of blowing your stack because I've seen lots of those <laughs> happen over time and they're highly uncomfortable and it doesn't end well. And some of these situations are so easily solvable uh, that it doesn't need to get to that to that level of craziness, I should say. So, uh, yeah, I hope that makes sense. Hopefully people out there who are teaching these courses, for those who are studying this stuff, that uh, some of these points are being raised because I think it's crucial that people need to be told. Yeah. I will tell people once again you are andrewhogue.com. Yep. And that's spelt H-A-U-G for those who might not know. Yep. And on Facebook, you're Andrew Hogue Radio. Yeah, and we have uh, free iPhone and Android apps as well. People can download to uh, take the station with them wherever they want. And, you know, future's here, man. Adapt. 
Yeah, and your live programs are on Monday from 8 till 10 with Heavy at Home, all Australian heavy metal and rock music. Yep. And Tuesday, Hogue Metal from 9 till midnight. Yeah, that's pretty much as much new music we could squeeze in. Generally a lot more from overseas, but also we do throw in a lot of, you know, established Australian acts as well that are, you know, touring or they've got a, a new record out. Yeah, we hit it hard because there's so much out there now. We've got to... um. We've got to make sure that uh, we cover and keep up to date as best we can because there is some great stuff coming out. Absolutely there is. So, you know, you've got to stay at the forefront and for those who want to stay ahead, that's the, that's, that's the program to listen to. Yeah. Thank you very much for your time. No, thank you, man. It was good to meet you at uh, Soundwave. I know it's hectic to, you know, I mean, that's a hectic time overall to even catch up and speak with people, but uh, appreciate the, the time and the opportunity. It was great to meet you and hopefully we will run into each other again and best of luck with everything you've got happening with your band and your radio station. Oh, likewise, man. Stay in touch. Definitely will and I will be listening more often. Awesome. Thank you very much and, yeah, hopefully we'll talk. Actually, no, we will. We will talk again when Contrive release their album. How's that? Yeah, for sure, man. I look forward to it. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Yeah, you too, mate. Take care. See ya.